Great. Uh, thank you all for uh, tuning in today. Uh, thanks to the Rachel Carson Center and thanks to the production team uh, for making this uh, talk happen virtually. Um, so my name is Kirk Sides. Uh, I'm a Carson Fellow uh, at the moment. Uh, I'm also a lecturer in the English Department at the University of Bristol in the UK. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you uh, from a project that I'm working on. Uh, it's a book manuscript. Um, and so I'll start by sort of framing uh, some of uh, the larger uh, context of the project itself which is titled African Anthropocene, the Ecological Imaginary in African Literatures. And the project explores the relationship between ecological thinking and anti-colonial politics in African literature and cultural production from across the 20th century. The main argument of the project is for an expanded historical timeline for thinking about the environment in African literature, film, and artistic production. I begin by linking decolonial thought in African literature from the early 20th century to forms of environmental awareness and ecological thinking. I then argue that the speculative turn of the last decade or so in African literature, a turn I see marked by planetary ecological concerns, that this turn itself can be traced back to at least the start of the 20th century. Historicizing these contemporary moves towards speculative and science fiction, African Anthropocene as a project reads both decolonial and ecological thought back through the archive of African literatures of the 20th century. The African Anthropocene, then, is a mode where environmental precarity and the possibilities of life on a damaged earth become tropes for writing both colonial pasts, but also the future of the African continent and the planet more broadly. Reading for what the project posits as eco-futurism in African literatures will link the post-apocalyptic and environmental futurism of recent writers such as Nnedi Okorafor to earlier generations of African writers such as Thomas Mofolo, Amos Tutuola, and Sol Plaki who themselves were equally invested in an ecological imaginary, which was itself rooted through ontologies of the futuristic, the mythical, and the speculative. Ecofuturism, then, is a, to, is a way to reread the history of African literature as deeply invested in mapping ecologies of the continent, which in the future might be imagined differently. So the section uh, that I'm presenting today is, uh, is titled uh, Ecofuturism, Science Fiction, Myth, mythopoesis and the African Anthropocene. And it begins with a question and provocation from Srivanas Aruvamadan, who asks, quote, if nuclear holocaust could eliminate not just lives, but life forms, what literary genres are adequate for representing such permanent annihilation? Indeed, much of the work engendered by the Anthropocene as a concept has to do with its ability to call into question not just categories, but the epistemological and ontological conditions for the creation of these categories in the first place. This is a well-rehearsed argument made by Timothy Morton, Deepesh Chakrabarti, and others. Ian Baucom and Matthew Omelsky's recent work on a special issue of the South Atlantic Quarterly thinks about how climate change precipitates a rethinking of the very architecture of knowledge. Likewise, Catherine Yusuf's more recent A Billion Black Anthropocenes or None critiques the global north broadly and white blind spots specifically, which she sees as animating much of the discourse on the Anthropocene, especially from within the academy. Yusuf's claim is that the existential angst that accompanies the mention of the word Anthropocene is authorized by certain globally positioned and specifically racialized subjects. Moreover, this angst of a dystopian future where the planet's ecological and climatic systems have spun out into an environmental apocalypse, this dystopia has become synonymous with the very word Anthropocene. However, this dystopic futurism can also work to erase the climatic and environmental realities and their long histories of a large portion of the indigenous and formerly colonized populations of the world. So Yusuf writes that, quote, if the Anthropocene proclaims a sudden concern with the exposure of environmental harm to white liberal communities, it does so in the wake of histories in which these harms have been knowingly exported to black and brown communities under the rubric of civilization, progress, modernization, and capitalism. The Anthropocene might seem to offer a dystopic future that laments the end of the world, but imperialism and ongoing settler colonialisms have been ending worlds for as long as they've been in existence. Anthropologist Anna Singh suggests that the time has come for new ways of telling stories beyond civilizational first principles. Without man and nature, all creatures can come back to life. Men and women can express themselves without the strictures of a parochially imagined rationality. No longer relegated to whispers in the night, such stories might be simultaneously true and fabulous. 
How else can we account for the fact that anything is alive in the mess we've made? Imagining the Earth in this way is not a globally new phenomenon, however. Rather, the recognition of what Singh calls, quote, interspecies entanglements that once seemed the stuff of fables is only radical when seen from a post-enlightenment history and ignores much of the cultural production that might fall under the heading of animist realism. Even storytelling which thinks about the environmental apocalypse of the world as a direct result of colonial violence itself has a deep historical precedence. For instance, indigenous, indigenous studies scholar and activist Kyle White writes that, quote, as a Potawatomi scholar and activist, I feel the indigenous peoples do not always share quite the same science fiction imaginaries of dystopian or apocalyptic futures when they, when they confront the possibility of a climate crisis. White's work is invested in a specifically narratological reorientation to the ontological foundations for thinking about the future. In other words, White employs a formal literary criticism in order to make an argument about who are the subjects of Anthropocene futures, and indeed even which narratives are allowed a future, dystopic or otherwise. For White, quote, instead of dread of an impending crisis, indigenous approaches to climate change are motivated through dialogic narratives between descendants and ancestors. We can see how paying attention to the dialogical structure of a shuttling between descendant and ancestor, past and present, instantiates a different narrative for thinking about climate crisis specifically, as well as for imagining ecologically. Perhaps White's dialogic formulation also allows us to rethink some of the language of crisis itself. Often crisis is a discourse which reinscribes certain linear eschatological teleologies, rather than investing in the circular and ongoing temporalities embedded not only in, in indigenous cosmologies, but also in culturally important categories of resistance, such as survivance. Such culturally encoded responses gesture towards the longevity of ongoing colonial ecocid ecocidal violence, rather than the climactic finitude often written under the sign of apocalypse. White's narratological approach blends indigenous cosmological orderings of the world with representational schema, which allows for a dialogical relationship between ancestors and descendants. This trans-historical dialogue is authorized by the acknowledgement of what he calls spiraling time, wherein it is possible to imagine, quote, living alongside future and past relatives simultaneously. For White, quote, experiences of spiraling time may be lived through narratives of cyclicality, reversal, dreamlike scenarios, simultaneity, counterfactuality, irregular rhythms, ironic uncyclicality, slipstreams, parodies of linear pragmatism, and eternality. If, as Donna Haraway suggests, it matters what stories tell stories, then in what follows, I want to offer a few examples where narrative is the site of contestation and negotiation over how certain pasts, as well as various kinds of stories used to hold these pasts, are able to be mobilized in the imagining of ecological futures in the face of environmental change. So my first example is uh, Pumzi, which is a short film directed by Kenyan filmmaker Waneri Kahiu. It's made in 2009 and first screened at the Sundance Film Festival in 2010. The film opens, as we see uh, on the slide here, 35 years after World War III, the Water War, with an aerial shot of a compound, the Maitu community in the East African Territory which we see from the cartographical angle of the shot is surrounded by a nuclear desert where, ne where nature is extinct and water has disappeared. The story follows the main character, Asha, who works in the Natural History Museum of the Maitu compound. And upon being sent an anonymous package containing a soil sample, which tests high for water content and low for radiation levels, she escapes the compound in search for the source of the soil. Asha steals the Maitu, or mother seed, a museum relic of the time before nature had died, in the hopes of planting the seed in the source of, of this seemingly healthy soil. Th meanwhile, the Maitu compound itself continues to exist in this post-crisis world because it harvests the energy of its inhabitants. Asha and the other members of the compound are encouraged to, quote, be your own power generator, 100% self-sustainable. So each resident of this community is forced to generate power for the compound through work on exercise machines. We watch as a barcode embedded in Asha's arm is scanned, allowing her entry into this gym-like space. And based on the scan, she is given an allotted and very small amount of water in order to proceed with her power generation. 
Ostensibly, the scan is also a means of biotechnical corporeal control exercised by the compound over its inhabitants, monitoring who has done the work of power generation. A microcosm of neoliberal ideological praxis, the compound is an eco-regime based on the rationing of water and the production of energy. Everyone must produce energy for the compound, but they labor under the idea, which we hear ceaselessly sounding through the intercoms, that they do this labor for themselves, as we hear, be your own power generator. The compound is certainly an example of what Achille and Bembe would call the necropolitical, a regime whose political economy is based on the power to withhold death in the service of sustaining bare life. But it is also worth noting here that in this post-crisis life world, this regime of survival is an instance of plantation economy, where residents are harvested for their power generating energy. But these enslaving violences are rooted through a neoliberal ideology of self-motivation and self-sustainability. The small amount of water Asha is given by the guard who scans her implanted barcode is meant to sustain her just long enough to do two things, work on the exercise machines in order to produce power, and through this exercise to generate sweat and urine, which are then converted back into potable water through osmosis machines located in the toilets of the compound. Through the work of each inhabitant, work they are told they are doing for themselves, the compound harvests power. The excess pr produced through this process, literally the sweat and excretion, is then reinvested into the bodies of these workers, thereby allowing them to go back to the power generating machines. And thus these worker residents are kept possibly just barely from dehydrating and the lights of the compound stay on. Everyone must do their part it seems, but everyone's part seems only to recreate the conditions for the survival of every single one. Inhabitants of the compound are individual silos of recycled power, ingestion and excretion, endless self-contained loops of auto-poetic production. The Mai Tzu compound is based on logics of bare survival, where sustainability is paramount, but not rehabilitation or revivification. These logics of survival are also invested exclusively in the maintenance of the compound itself, in the continuation of its economies of waste and recycling, and to a lesser extent in the bare existence of its inhabitants. Anything outside these economies is not able to be acknowledged. Indeed, the compound is hostile to the idea of life outside of its own forms of production and reproduction. When Asha places the anonymous soil sample on a scanner, it is registered as an unauthorized procedure, and she is told that she will meet with counsel, who appear in a hologram form on the screen in front of her. Asha communicates to the three women who make up the council that she has, quote, found the perfect soil sample and planted the mitu seed. It's growing. Asha continues, I would like to apply to the council for an exit visa. This could mean that there's life on the outside. A member of the council counters Asha, saying, that's impossible. You should have cleared it with security. Get rid of it. As Asha pleads that, if I could find the original soil, she is cut off by the council leader. The outside is dead. But the soil is alive, Asha contends. The head council member denies the exit visa. And, and yet Asha persists. But I know it's alive. I know it is. It has to be. Look. As Asha places her hand on the scanner containing the soil, and the scanner passes over both hand and soil, a digital image of a broad tree blooming in the desert appears before the council. In the image, Asha is seen smiling in front of the tree and then submerged beneath water. First we see the image of the tree, uh, and then Asha beneath the water. The council is seemingly given a glimpse here into Asha's subconscious and the earlier dream she had of the tree when she first encountered the soil. A dream which the neurological monitors of the compound detected and ordered Asha to take her dream suppressants. The investment in the internal economies of the compound mean that not only is the geographical outside denied viability or life creating potential, but in a fo another form of biotechnical control, the individual subconscious seems to be equally threatening as a landscape outside the sovereignty of this regime of survival. The political economy of the compound, and hence its sovereignty, exists solely under the sign of bare maintenance. Anything that might hold the potential to revivify, not simply recycle, is perceived as a threat. This eco-regime, represented by the council in the film, exercises its control over the narrative of humans' interactions with their environment. One of the ways we see this contest contestation over narrative play out in the film is in relation to the seed that Asha steals and eventually plants after escaping the compound, named the Maitu seed. In the first moments of the film, we are shown a museum placard where the seed is kept and which gives us the etymology of the seed's name from Kikuyu, Ma, 
or truth, itu or ours, translates to mother. Not only does the seed carry generational weight, symbolizing regeneration, but when it is eventually planted in the soil outside the compound, Asha has symbolically planted a narrative, a story, our truth in the soil outside. Beyond the symbolic value, it is also a very physical and material story the seed carries, one that has been nurtured and watered by the, no the moisture from Asha's own body. And here we see Asha planting the seed. In doing so, she also plants her own chemical and cellular narrative in the soil in an attempt to story a different future. Pumzi allows space for Sylvia Winter's claim that humans are a storytelling species, and our stories, especially our origin stories, have an impact on our neurobiological and physiological behaviors. But by focusing on the entangled story between Asha and the seed, the film also offers the possibility of a non-anthropocentric and sympoetic narrative making for the Anthropocene. And here, I want to focus on the flashing image of the tree that punctuates both Asha's dreams as well as her journey out into the nuclear desert beyond the compound. The tree offers a foundational creation myth as narrative mode for imagining outside the technological dystopia of the compound, as well as the apocalyptic te teleologies of an ecologically destroyed planet. In terms of geographical context, we've already been located in the region of East Africa in the film's opening moment. And we've seen the linguist linguistic associations of the compound to Kikuyu language. The ficus sycamorous tree, which we see flash up in front of Asha several times in the film, is central to Kikuyu mythology. Indeed, the very name Kikuyu is derived from the tree, Mikoyo, that the creator, Mogai, figured as central to the creation of the people and their relationship to the earth. The name of the people themselves, the Agakuyu, means children of the sycamore tree. Jomo Kenyatta writes that, quote, In the beginning of things, when mankind started to populate the earth, the man, Gakuyu, was called by Mokai, and standing atop Mount Kenya, pointed out to Gakuyu a spot full of fig trees. So it is here that the cosmological foundations of planetary life for the Gakuyu people start, in the image of a tree rising up out of the landscape. The recurring image of the tree in Pumzi clearly gestures to this creation story in which the land and the people to live on it are figured through a series of ecological relationships which exist in the past, but which, as we see, are continually being rooted through the present and future temporalities of Asha's quest to plant new life. Both the tree as symbol and the dream sequence as narrative structure articulate a vision of spiraling time as a kind of temporal epistemology for thinking about how the past and future of ecological relationships are connected. Various forms of storytelling, I want to suggest, might offer representational strategies for reflecting upon the entangled nature of ecological pasts with ecological futures. In other words, in this instance, the creation myth functions as an ecological storytelling mode for thinking about and imagining the future. The film uses this mode to explore the potentialities of both past and future ecological dispensations, which are other and different to the totalizing claims of world building within the compound, specifically, and dominant world organizing systems such as colonialism and capitalism more generally. Pumzi, then, is an example of how narrative and world making practices are engaged in response to a damaged earth. It is also an example of how the climate change of the Anthropocene is apprehended through historical narratives embedded in local cultures, which point towards long established ideas of world making and storytelling. The future of planetary precarity is rooted in this film through the creation myth of the Kikuyu peoples, one that reroutes ideas of collective storytelling as a mode through which to imagine and reimagine ways of living in and with ecological crisis. So I'll conclude with another uh, brief example from Nigerian-American writer Nedia Korofor's 2014 novel, Lagoon. A Korofor's Lagoon is set in a world in which alien encounters presage po positive environmental change. These aliens heal the waters of Lagos Harbor, which, are which we know are notoriously polluted due to runoff and spills from the multinational petrol mining industry based in the Niger Delta. Okorafor flips the script of much science fiction, and especially that from that of the Global South, writing an alien encounter story that does not function solely as a proxy narrative or allegory for colonial encounter. Responding to accusations and interrogations from the humans of Lagos, 
Ayodele, the benevolent alien arrival, explicitly states that, quote, we do not seek your oil or your other resources. We are here to nurture your world. This nurturing that Ayodele foretells is a kind of a unique kind of healing. It's a form of rehabilitation that is not purely a return to some kind of pristine idyll. Rather, this healing portends an entirely new ecological dispensation, which produces change, radical change, seen in the marine life of Lagos Harbor. Approaching this seemingly benevolent alien encounter with a hint of skepticism, I suggest that the healing change is radical because it is able to contain multiple ontologies of both a past implied in healing to be returned to, as well as the future of something entirely new. And this newness, I argue, comes less from the interventions of aliens and more from the novel's ability to access and mobilize a local ecology of narratives about this place. So for instance, the novel opens in an act of multi-species eco-activism, where a sentient swordfish punctures an underwater crude oil pipe. The scene calls to mind the long histories of environmental and political activism in and around the Niger Delta, and especially the highly publicized case of Ken Sarawiwa and the Ngoni Nine, who were executed by Nigeria's military regime in 1995 for their environmental activism against Shell Oil Corporation, which was conspicuously silent during both the trial and execution. However, in the novel, the act of sabotage by the swordfish against the oil drilling company coincides with the arrival of aliens in Lagos Harbor, an arrival which has simultaneously healed and drastically changed these waters. The swordfish herself feels the change, transforming in size and shape and becoming, quote, ancestral creature and monster. After the alien arrival, we are told that the ocean off the coast of Lagos is more alive than it has been in centuries and is teeming with aliens and monsters. In Lagoon, the aliens and monsters that are added to the multi-species life world of Lagos point towards both past ancestral forms as well as towards a future of monstrously healed species being. A core four must move across and between multiple generic repertoires in order to imagine these entirely new ecologies of relation, it's from, from fantasy to science fiction to African futurism. Lagoon invests in innovative and additive mythopoesis, making and adding to a West African pantheon of figures and forces in the ecosystemic healing of Lagos. In creating the life worlds of Lagos, a core four employs an animist unconscious approach which Harry Garuba describes as a process of, quote, the re continual re-enchantment of the world. For instance, a core four employs a narrator named Udide Akwanka, or Spider the, the Artist, who is closely related to the popular Anansi spider storyteller of Ghana. But to these already existing and known characters of Nigerian lore, a core four also adds her own unique creation of the Bone Collector, a sentient section of the Lagos Benin Highway, who consumes the bodies of humans and vehicles. The novel can be read as an engagement with West African animist cosmologies, as well as a creative mythopoetic supplementing of their ranks. Acts of mythopoesis, Akorafor's novel suggests, are radical imaginative acts, which point towards usable pasts and potentially livable futures. World building and rebuilding, in the best sense if it is not to slip quickly into the utilitarianism of techno fixes, must first start with world imagining. A mythopoesis for a damaged planet is not a diversion in this sense, nor is it an aesthetic turning away from the realities of a precarious planet, but rather it is a necessary step in thinking through our relationships to the earth and asking how ways of imagining the world might influence our future ways of being in the world. By reworking local cosmologies and by investing in the mythopoeic, a core four offers a new ecological dispensation for the future. What this suggests, I argue, is that perhaps what is needed is more storytelling, more creative potential which bursts out of the rigid temporal and ideological progressions of linear modernity, especially if that modernity is marked by coloniality and its space-making practices. Perhaps environmentalism, then, is first an act of imagining otherwise, imagining other forms of ecological relations, imagining speculative, livable futures in acts of story. In the final chapter of Lagoon, the narrator of the novel introduces itself. We learn that we have been reading a story written and told by Udide Akwanka. After its introduction, relating the long history of its spidery presence in a cave under the city of Lagos, Udide tells the reader that it has actually spun the web of stories uh, that make up Lagos. 
But we also learn that Udide recognizes the ecological precarity of the moment, as it tells us that, quote, for the first time since the birth of Lagos, my glorious city, I will pause in my storytelling. I will leave my web. I become part of the story. I will join my people. It seems that alien intervention will not be enough to save Lagos, or by extension, the planet. And what is needed is recourse to deep cultural archives as modes of storytelling in the Anthropocene. An example of what Nadia Korfor has described as her style of organic fantasy, we see here a moment of not just multi-species ecological concern and action, but a trans-cosmological movement across ontologies, from the story creator's plane to the plane of the story itself. The teller of the story steps into the story in an act of ecologically engaged mythopoesis. Dustin Crawley writes that Okorafor gives space to the various human, technological, natural, and spiritual actors constituting post-human relations by revolutionizing and evolutionizing the genre itself, combining science fiction's techno-scientific speculations with African animist modes to create a more cosmopolitan narrative field of voices. I argue that what both Cahieu and Okorafor demonstrate is a need for a collaborative and entangled approach to environmental crisis, one that looks to pasts, historical, mythological, and mythopoeic, as usable and present in the creation of new ecological relations. For Kahiu, it is the creation myth of the Gikuyu, figured through the sycamore tree, as well as the entangled agencies and chemical compositions of human and seed that offer the possibility of a changed future. For a core for animal, alien, and cosmic storyteller creator all contribute to the ecological writing and writing of the environments of Lagos. These are sympoetic constellations of ecological concern made together. And bending the etymology towards the literary production meaning of poesis, these are ecological imaginaries that are also written collaboratively. Living together in multi-species entanglements seems to be taken as a truism of the Anthropocene discourse of our moment. But what I argue for in this project is the ways in which many African authors have imagined modes of storying together for changed ecological futures. Thank you.